Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Kim Scholzer and I'm the super proud host of Sympathy Lab. I'm standing here together with my colleague Alina. And Alina is the reporter, the voice for everything around Gen Z. So for our topic on sustainable design, you did a research. You did already a lot of interviews. What's on there? So I talked to our expert on sustainable design, Anna Steyer. She told me a lot about how the design process works right now and what the issues are. And then we went to ISPO, a really big event for the outdoor industry, and we spoke to other people from Gen Z about what they think are the issues with sustainable design and what we can do about it. And I'm really looking forward to letting all of you out there know. And letting us know means call to action. Let's go. Welcome to the Sympathy Lab. You don't know me yet, so let me introduce myself. I'm Alina, I'm 25 years old, and that makes me a member of the so-called Gen Z. I and many others in my generation are a little bit worried about this thing called climate change. Now, I heard that the textile and apparel industries have quite a big influence on this issue. According to the Fashion on Climate report by the Global Fashion Agenda, the fashion industry produced 2.1 billion tons of CO2 in 2018. That accounts for about 4% of global CO2 emissions and is more than Germany's, France's, and the UK's CO2 emissions combined. So I need to consume my fashion responsibly in order to support climate action. But how do I do that? I've done a bit of research into sustainable clothes and here's what I came up with. Sustainable clothing is rare, expensive, and it's not as aesthetically pleasing as many clothes that popular fast fashion brands are producing. Why is that? And what can be done to change it? This episode, we're finding out all about sustainable design. To understand why clothes are designed the way they are designed, I decided to speak to Anna Steyer, who works at Sympatex. Since 1986, Sympatex has put its efforts into creating sustainable apparel for the outdoor sector, like jackets and shoes. Anna is responsible for the coloring process of their functional fabrics. She explains the process like this. At first, um, the, the brand uh, creates an idea of how the collection should look like or how the new garment should look like. And it's, it's always like the colors and the design and everything, the inspiration is always uh, for a collection for one season. Uh, and it works all together. There's a jacket, uh, it's fitting to a pants or a monosuit in the same colors. So it's not just one piece. You have a whole collection which needs to be um, matching together and after this there there should be a technician or somebody who um, is experienced in manufacturing or knows how to sew the garment these people need to uh, like write down a description of a garment and uh, it, this description is um, needed for the manufacturer because the manufacturer cannot work just with a scratch from the designer. So they need a little bit more, they need measurements, they need to know which fabric it should be and everything. So everything goes to the manufacturer. There will be produced at the first samples. The manufacturer orders all the, the trims, the zippers, um, the laminate, the fabric they need. And uh, at the end, the manufacturer presents the first samples to the brand. And with these samples, usually the brand has their salesman um, meeting and they're presenting the new collection to their salesmen. And the salesmen uh, give their feedback and uh, depending on the brand um, construction, how they work, um, the salesman presenting to um, the market the new collection. And then there comes a point where the orders come in. And uh, at this point, the brand tells to the manufacturer, we need thousands of this jacket or whatever. And at this point, the manufacturer is order ordering the fabric, laminates, zippers, and so on for the whole bike production. The bike production starts and the manufacturer need to control their quality. They do at the end, of course, uh, a big quality control before the parts are shipped out. And then uh, they mostly ship it um, within a few weeks to wherever they needed to have in Europe and USA. So that's the whole process. Not a simple one. When it comes to designing sustainable but functional clothes, such as outdoor apparel that needs to be waterproof, being truly sustainable is even more difficult. 
Waterproofing clothes is currently done by using a process called DWR treatment. DWR stands for durable water repellent. During this treatment, clothes are coated with fluoropolymer, a substance which causes the so-called lotus effect and makes water droplets roll right off the surface. Fluoropolymer belongs to a group of chemicals called PFAS, per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. These man-made chemicals are damaging to the environment and human health in their production and disposal. They're also dubbed so-called forever chemicals. PFAS are extremely persistent, meaning once they've been emitted into the environment, that's where they stay. This problem is so serious that the European Union is currently discussing a ban on the use of all PFAS by 2025. On top of having clothing with a function, most people also want their fashion to be aesthetically pleasing. When it comes to making fabrics more visually appealing by adding color, most producers currently dye their textiles. But there is already a more efficient and sustainable process available. When you produce a polyester fabric, you have really, really small granulate, like it looks like a Lego or something, yes? And this usually does not have any color. And you, you heat it up, and then you, you press it uh, through a thing and what which comes out are the small uh, fibers of polyester. And then after it, you uh, do a yarn of it and out of the yarn you can um, knit or wove or whatever fabric out of this. And then the first process where you have this small granulate before everything starts, in the very first step, there you can put in color. And when you put in the color at this early stage, the, curly, the color has a really, really good color fastness. So when sunlight comes, for example, when the UV rays comes, this color can, uh, can be pretty for years because it's in the fiber itself. And that's a more sustainable way of dyeing. Yes, that's really sustainable way because you need to have this granulate nevertheless and then you can add color and it's all done comparing to a normal dyeing process where you need a lot of water because it's like dyeing at home so when we compare the normal um, dyeing process we have right now and spin dye we can reduce uh, water and chemicals this innovative process is called spin dye it is unfortunately not widespread yet According to Anna, one of the reasons sustainable design solutions are barely implemented in the industry are the so-called MOQs. That stands for Minimum Order Quantity. Meaning, there's a certain amount of product that needs to be ordered before the seller will even consider selling to a company. The more innovative a design solution is, the higher its MOQ is likely to be, making it really difficult for a lot of smaller businesses to adopt these measures at a viable price point. On the other hand, Big fast fashion corporations like Shein, for example, produce as many clothes as they can for the least amount of money possible. This volume of production is simply impossible with sustainable measures. But Anastaya thinks it might just be a matter of time until the industry gets used to these innovations. We have started with the old process and now we have a lot of companies all over the globe doing it and you cannot say okay we have something new it's better even if it's better and, and it's better i'm sure about that but you cannot change it from today to tomorrow it needs more time and more experience we need a big change in our system to get all the fashion sustainable so now we know why a lot of sustainable clothing is rare and expensive and thus not very popular but what can we do about it to find out, Sympathy Lab conducted its first ever Young Professionals workshop series at the last ISPO Munich. ISPO is the most important platform for sports, sporting goods and sports business. At the ISPO trade fair in Munich, professionals from all walks of life come together. We make them meet and have an impactful conversation about truly important topics. Just like the Sympathy Lab, ISPO Munich put a special emphasis on combating climate change by introducing its sustainability hub. This is where the Sympathy Lab Young Professionals workshops took place. The goal of these workshops was to make industry experts and the young generation meet. During their constructive conversation, the participants brainstormed points for a charter to the industry. Here's what some of our young participants had to say. 
A lot of people are not aware of the complexity of the issues. Like they just think, okay, recycled, good, we're done, it's sustainable. Um, and it's not necessarily just on the small scale of the materials, it's also about the bigger picture of what do we do once the product is out there on the market. That's also our job as designers, to think about what will happen to the product once it reaches the consumer and more importantly after it leaves the consumer as well. How is it brought back to the manufacturer? How is it recycled locally? And all of those things are also something that we need to take accountability for and design into the product. Everyone in the supply chain and every stakeholder involved in uh, producing garments, for example, um, has to be aware of the fact that um, it is time to act and time to make the whole industry more sustainable. It's not always uh, one answer fits all. Um, I mean, if you have a company that sells a product from Europe to China, it makes no sense for that company to take it back to Europe to recycle. So I think that we, as a young generation, um, we're really willing to act and willing to act quickly because um, we see the urgency of the problem. And I think um, not only talking about problems, but using workshops like this as an occasion for concrete actions in order to make production um, more sustainable. I think this is what the older generations can learn from us. I think a lot of times it's also just about making the producers aware that just because it's working fine now doesn't mean that it's the best way of doing it. Yeah, I think there are so many cool and different solutions popping up in the last yeah, days, weeks, months, and there are so many more to come. And when I'm just looking around, I see so many different solutions which are worth a look. So I'm definitely optimistic um, when it comes to the future and sustainability. In the end, the charter points for the Workshop on Sustainable Design can be summarized as follows. Number one. Promotion of innovation. A lot of times, innovative solutions are too expensive or simply ignored because the way we've always done it is working just fine. This mindset is detrimental to the progress we are trying to achieve and must be overcome. Instead, new solutions should be supported and promoted to ensure a quick integration into the production process. Number two, re-evaluation of priorities. It's important that companies analyze and reevaluate the current process. Are there certain aspects where resources are being wasted and can they be used to further sustainable measures in design and production? Number three, cohesion in the industry. No one can change the world alone. The textile industry needs to stick together when it comes to prioritizing sustainability in its products. Number four, collaboration across industries. Climate change is obviously not caused by just the textile industry alone. That's why it is important that we not only collaborate within the industry, but inspire and involve others to participate in the movement as well. Number five, education of the consumer. A lot of consumers don't know how the design process works or what the chemicals used in it can do to us humans and our environment. It is important that we promote communication and knowledge transfer with the consumer. Their influence can help us further the progress towards a more sustainable future. So that's what young people think can be done about the current state of sustainable design. Now I wonder, how are we going to make consumers like me aware of all the changes that will be made? In our next episode, we will be talking to Gabriel Arthur, founder of Sustin Magazine, about the current issues in sustainable communications and we'll find out what can be done about them together with our Sympathy Lab Young Professionals Workshop participants. See you then.